Today, we're going to be meeting with a special guest from our exhibitions department. The Natural History Museum is home to 35 million objects and specimens, and our staff use these collections and these objects in our exhibits to conduct research about people and nature, past and present. Each of our staff has a special area of focus, but together we're helping to learn and share about the history of life on our planet. So in just a moment, we're going to hear from Tim Bovard, our museum taxidermist. Taxidermy is the art of preserving and arranging an animal with lifelike effect. You've probably seen some taxidermy if you've been to the museum's North American mammal halls or the African mammal hall. Tim has always loved these famous diorama halls. Fascinated with natural history at an early age, He's been doing taxidermy um, since he was 10 years old by learning from instructional books. In high school, Tim worked in a commercial taxidermy studio and then completed his apprenticeship program. Since 1984, Tim has worked at the Natural History Museum as a taxidermist and model maker, which includes designing, fabricating, and restoring our famous dioramas. Many of our dioramas, including the lion diorama that Tim will share about pictured here, have been enhanced, modified, or completely redone since these dioramas were first presented to the public in the 1920s. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today and you will see me again in a little bit. Hi, Tim. Hi, hi all. Thank you for coming to visit me in my studio um, and giving me a chance to talk about something I love, which is animals, wildlife and natural history. So, um, so here we go. Uh, if you look at this diorama, all right, this is a picture of the lion diorama when I got to the museum, okay? Really looks pretty nice. It's a nice diorama, okay? But what it depicts is one male lion, one female lion, and a couple of cubs. And that is not the way prides are based, meaning lion groups. Lion groups are female based, and then the males come and go as their dominance in the region is higher or lower, okay? But the pride itself that sticks together year after year is females. So what I hoped I was be able to do while I was here um, and eventually we've gotten to that point in 2018, 2019, was to change that diorama and make it so that more females and females were the dominant element in that visually. And the males were still there, but they weren't the dominant element. And we still had a couple of cubs. And so it would be more like what you would see from a lion pride when they were resting, okay? And, you know, cats are cats. So uh, I actually live with house cats at home. And part of the behaviors I see, I've seen with lions and with other cats, of course, I see at home on a daily basis. Um, so first, ideas. So one of the great things about lions is they are social. And as they walk back into the pride, they often head rub, okay, as a way of bonding. And I see this with my little house cats at home, right? Same thing. And so first thing is, I sort of, I wanted to show that. And so, and I wanted that to be the prominent part. So the first change that happened after the diorama was, well, the first change that happened was that diorama you saw went away and we actually built a diorama that was based on a large rock pile or kopi like for some of you who've been out to Joshua Tree National Park you may have seen them there they're all over the world um, and well when I was in Africa I saw this one kopi almost every day when we were out and there was a pride of lions, so you definitely use that on a regular basis. So that was my basis to change the diorama. And then I wanted to allow enough room so when I, if I got other females, I could add them in. So the first priority to me was have females be dominant, what you saw viewing wise. And so the first pair I wanted to work on 
was a pair doing that greeting. And so in order to do that, of course, I need reference. So here is a measurement sheet. This is taken of one of the females. Um, and so those females and the male as well, I have full measurement sheets so that when I want to mount them or create this artificial sculpture, I can buy something like this. So here is a mannequin, the walking mannequin, head rubbing mannequin, originally, okay? And then I started to modify it down for size and position. So it got a cut into about, oh, probably 40 pieces while I sized it down. And eventually, here's sort of a back view of it. Um, it was carved down to the point where it would fit her skin. At the same time, I wanted to take another form and have it be a lying down form that that female was walking up to and head rubbing. Because this is a common thing you see. Female step gets up or she's been out away from the pride or male walks back in, walks over to one of their buddies and head rubs. And so, um, and here it is starting to play with it with the sitting form, the one that got modified into the laying down for both the females you're gonna see that are laying down. Came, one came along later. And then they had to be put together. And so here they are being sewn up. So this was a wet tan skin. In these case, these skins were almost 30 years old by the time I mounted them up wet the tan skin up, stretched it, thinned it, clay in the toes, clay around the eyes, glass eyes for everything, uh, clay around the earbuds, clay in the toes to start to develop the look I wanted to see. And my test sort of for whether this was gonna work or not was right after I got the skins together, I, uh, I told staff, Hey, if you want to come by and see, see what they look like out in my studio, please do. And when they walked out and saw this, cat people, people who weren't cat people, they all did the same thing. There was a, a, a vocalization that almost everybody did, meaning they said something. And it was like, oh, all right, they got it. These are two animals being social with each other and that's the message. And they are the central part, of course, of that diorama, which you can look at the, the finished diorama and see. So this was the start. This was 2018 for getting to where we are today. Really, the start happened back in 19, in the early 1990s when I modified the group the first time. And then slowly but surely trying to add females to that group as they were available and as my time was available. So once we got to that point, then I wanted to go to the next step. I had one more female to add. So I've now got four females in the group, one that's on her back, laying down with her feet up in the air, just relaxing, um, common pose. You see it on, our, of course, the house cat at home. For those of you who have house cats or have friends with house cats, they'll do that flop on their back thing. Usually, of course, it means they want to have their belly rubbed, but it means they're comfortable too. Um, so next phase then is I wanted to add another female. And so this was going to be a grooming female. So I, once again, was going to need to modify a form. So modify that sitting form into that position. All right. And because grooming, of course, cats are famous for the grooming they do. And so that's, that's pretty much it. A little more detail went in before the skin went on. Once again, clay went on. Then the other one I wanted to do back in the back where you wouldn't see it necessarily unless you walk to the far left side of the exhibit. If you stand in the central part of the exhibit, you're gonna see one male 
five females and one or two cubs. That's to me is a good thing. You've got to move clear to the left to see the last male I added. And that is because I still wanted dominant five females in view and just one male. And what's the male doing? He's scratching an ear. So here's my reference for that. Okay. And I had a couple of different types of things and I like this one the best. So that this is what that, what I went for. So in order to get that, I had this form. This form is was sculpted was uh, sculpted by a commercial taxidermist for commercial use. But it's a, a man who lives in South Africa, Travis, and he's a very good sculptor. And this was way bigger than what I needed. So and it was of course a completely different position. So then Daniel Meng and I, the friend who came in to help me, did this to it. So you can see the clay starting to go on. Uh, we need the clay where there were going to be wrinkles. We needed clay where the feet were going to be going on. Clay, of course, around the eyes and the nose and the ear butts. And so this is what we had before the skin went on. And then we put the skin on. And I think you can see in that sort of. Oh, one other thing I'm just going to say is I did do test fittings too. So here's the diorama after the two head rubbing lines went in with the female form that was grooming, right? So I'm looking at sight lines and trying to make sure it's going to work within the group. I also, over my shoulder here, you can see I have a miniature scale model. And so in that scale model, I have all the lines sort of roughly in the position so I could play with my sight lines without even being downstairs. But obviously before I put the skins on, on something that I'm doing this much labor and it's this unique, I wanna be sure everything's gonna work visually. And that's the case with any diorama I'm working on, right? Doesn't matter if it's a lion diorama. What I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is get to a point where I think the whole diorama works together. And when I have an existing diorama, like this one, in this case with this diorama, of course, I built it originally as that pile of rocks with this big table flat area on a rock that I felt I could add four or five, hopefully, maybe six more lions on that top area. And that's what I've done. So in our final, we do have two old cubs that date from the 1940s that really you know, don't look as lifelike anymore. And I've done what I could with them, but hey, they just, they're not as lifelike. So they're sort of in the background. Then I have the male and female from the 1960s, the George Adams, a sculptor taxidermist we had here, just excellent taxidermist who sculpted over the skeletons of those two lions to create clay models, which he then molded in plaster, and then paper mache, and then finally put the skin over that paper mache sculpture with glass eyes and clay, just like I've done. Whereas my technique now for animals that are common out there or more common that I can find forms for is, like I've shown you, I buy a commercial form and then modify it. And so all I'm doing, I'm sculpting too, but I'm sculpting in the same medium that that skin, that that skin is going to go on. And I can cut them all up. I'm going to show you here. Here is some of this polyurethane form. This happens to be a sculpt, a skunk form. Here's the leg, right? That's going to go on it. And I can change the position. I can cut it all up. There's no wires, no rods in it. And then after I'm done, re-sculpting it the way I want to my anatomy. Look, once again, following my measurement chart, I can make this look like the animal it was 
rather than the original sculpture. And it saves me time. Home form, re-sculpt it, work it into my diorama. And a lot of what I do in this case, of course, since the 90s, that group has been completely redone. All right. So it's as you can see from that original picture, it's a very different look from what it was. And to me, I didn't have any objections when I looked at this as a young person, as a visitor to the museum. I liked it, except it was just a male, female, and two cubs, which is not what you typically see in an African pride. Prides can number up to even more than 20 females in a pride. I've done sort of a average to small pride, five females, a couple of cubs. I'd love to add more cubs, but cubs aren't something I'm going to get um, from zoos or uh, donations from the wild. That's just not going to happen. And so I'm working with the existing cubs we have. Um, anyways, it's um, it's a pretty neat thing for me. And in order to do this, of course, I pulled in somebody, like I said, Daniel Mang, who was excited to come and work on, oh my goodness, doing a male lion, <laughs> scratching his ear, he will never do that again, okay? For me, I'd rather have that than anything, right? Because when I watch cats, and you see this, you watch a cat, and I watch this with our cats at home, they'll sometimes be scratching or something, and something will catch their attention, and they'll freeze and they'll hold that position. And that is the idea there. Same with that grooming female, licking her leg. Okay, same with those two head buddy. They're, they're in a position they could hold for a little bit. It's not necessarily an action pose. It is in some ways, but in some ways it's not. Um, we of course have other things here that are action poses with things jumping and stuff like that. But what I'm trying to create and have you look at and enjoy is this collective pride of lions, females going about their social behaviors and males hanging out and cubs chewing on a couple of zebra legs. Ah, uh, for me, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Rachel. I think that's got it. That was awesome, Tim. Thank you so much for sharing the story of this incredible diorama. Loved hearing about the process and we have a lot of great questions. So I'm gonna jump right into them. Right. Um, Aiden, Shiloh, Henry, and Brooke were curious, among others, um, how and why did you get into studying taxidermy? Uh, you know, I grew up loving animals. The first story that my parents would tell people was, I'd walked up to one of our neighbors with my hand out like this, and when I opened it up, I had a live black widow spider, female, in palm of my little delicate little hand at three years old, because it was so interesting. Needless to say, I and I don't remember what happened after that. My guess is she politely managed to get it out of my hand and, you know, smushed it or whatever. I, you know, I don't know. But a fascination with animals as a kid, absolutely. And luckily, I grew up in a family that, well, I was definitely a natural history nerd, but that was okay. And then when I was 10, um, you know, I regularly find animals and they might be, they might be a gopher, you know, trapped in somebody's lawn. It might be in the case of the first animal I mounted, it was a roadkill skunk. Here's this absolutely gorgeous black and white little animal. Could I bring it back to life? And of course I couldn't really, but I could try. And I had booklets. And so the fascination, and it still is the same for me today as the kid I am today. As you can tell, I like what I do is taking that animal, in this case, that skunk, and creating an artificial body for it, which I did out of wrapped material, uh, which I don't see right, yeah, like this. I wrapped the body out of this stuff and got some glass eyes and put it together and everybody was quite impressed. Of course, did it really look like a skunk? No, but that fascination for me, and it's about really all of, it's not just animals, but 
you know, I like plants, I like rocks, took a fair amount of geology and botany and stuff like that, because of course a diorama is this collection of sort of everything that would surround an animal in a habitat. Very cool. And kind of related to some of what you were just talking about, um, Ileana and Lucas were curious about the process for making kind of the initial form or sculpture. Can you speak to what you use to make those or what that process looks like? In general, like I say, I'm gonna work with a urethane foam form like this, which is, which is you know, pretty strong, okay? And then I'll put wires or rods in it when I get it all re-sculpted the way I want. And um, you can see on this side, right? I've drilled my lines where I might put wires in. And also you can see what it is, right? What I just talked about. So, and it's pretty secure and it's pretty durable. I mean, I can, I could drop this and it wouldn't break. Now, if I threw it down, it would. And sometimes when they're shipped in, they're broken. But of course, I'm gonna cut them up and re-sculpt them anyway. So, yeah. So in today's world, when I first started out back in the 60s, I was using paper mache, burlap and plaster, and wrapped mannequins, just like they did here prior to my being here, okay? Um, but we all know technology and even in taxidermy, it's moved along. Super cool. Ariel is curious, um, can you tell us a little bit about the process for the skins? So what do the skins get soaked in and what kind of chemicals do you use um, they were also wondering, can you show us something from the workshop that's behind you that you're maybe working on right now, if there's something that's easily grabbable? I'm going to grab back here that's sort of in process. Well, here's a real common, common bird for you, a local scrub jay, right? And this bird actually amounted quite a bit ago, but I'm, I've just... I've just done some changes to it and clean up to it because it's going to go into a diorama. This has been in the bird hall, in the birdhouse, and, and we pulled that birdhouse out. And so now I'm going to rehab this bird and it's going to go into a diorama. So as far as time, how this works, I'm going to spend about a day or a little less on the average bird. Now that might be done over a period of time because often as soon as I get something in, myself or my volunteers, which I really, really miss my volunteers, right? Normally I have, you know, three volunteers here on Wednesday and three on Thursday. And of course they haven't been here since before last March. And I miss them because they help me with a lot of prep work and need taxidermy and plant making and all kinds of stuff. So about a day on the average bird, a day or two on the average small mammal, um, something like those lions, oh, I end up with weeks on them, right? By the time I've, I've done the planning, I've re-sculpted a form, and then, and then multiple people, of course, at the last part of it, helping me sew. Because if I'm just sewing with something like that myself, I could take a couple of days to, you know, four or five days to sew it, and I'd rather have it happen quicker than that. Because the sewing has to be very fine on something like those lions, because the skin is so short. If it was something like a big bear with a heavy hair or like this bird, Ah, the, the sewing on this bird, they're about, stitches are about a quarter inch apart because the feathers, of course, are going to cover it. So something, we, we also obviously, there's model making, right? So I'm going to spend the day or so on the average small, here's a turtle. Um, but it, so it can run anywhere. Probably the things I spent the longest on here is the gorilla downstairs and uh, that laying down polar bear like this down in Age of Mammals because that was done from a 1965 bear rug that I had to take apart and then glue hundreds of pieces over my sculpted form because the skin was falling apart because I didn't have a new skin. And that's the thing. I have to work with what we have. Sometimes that means I'm rehabbing an old mount. Sometimes like the polar bear, I'm taking an old rug and trying to make it in something lifelike. Some cases I'm taking like these lions, I've had them in storage for years, finally got a chance so I could dedicate the time to do what I wanted and produce them. Um, a lot of things, if I don't have it, 
I can't do it. So it's, so we have obviously a lot of stuff stored in freezers, mostly as tanned or salted dried skins. That alpaca that's down in Asian mammals, oh, that's sat in the freezer salted and dried for more than 20 years. I got it in the 80s and actually mounted it about 2010 for our Age of Mammals haul. So that's the kind of thing, is the sum of the time elements. Very cool. And we did have some students that were curious um, specifically about um, Henry Preston, William, and Caden. They were wondering, what was the timeline like? How long does it take you, for example, to work on this lion diorama, updating that? Oh, well, um, the, the final push was over a couple of years, but I wasn't working on it. I work on lots of other things. So I will tell you, it was very compressed when we actually put the lions together. The first time I had Daniel here, I had him here for three days. So we literally went 24 seven. And then I continued to go 24 seven, meaning sleeping here at the museum. We didn't go home, slept here in sleeping bags and actually shipping blankets at the museum. Um, we'd, have an, we'd have meals, of course. We slept about four, four or so hours, five hours a night. And then we'd get right back in just because I wanted to use his skills because I could work with Daniel. Daniel's got enough background and stuff that we could work together almost like we have a mind link. Okay. Now my volunteers are great, but they don't have the experience. I'll set them up. Like I set them up sewing, right? And then boom, they're good. Here's what you need to do sewing. And they just sew. So they did a lot of the sewing on those. So in a week, the first two, that head rubbing male and female, or head rubbing two females, we did them in a week. And then of course they dried for about four weeks before they went into the diorama. In the case of the male and female, Daniel only had two days. So we did one one day and one the next day. Now the sewing continued after that, but they were together, the skin was pinned in place, and it was just showing and pushing details. And that's one thing that has to have taxidermy, the name. If you look at those lines, you see going to see there's some wrinkles and that kind of thing. Well, that has to be worked in into the clay I put there to create that soft look. If I tried to have that sculpted in hard in the form, oh, it'd look hard. And the illusion of taxidermy is trying to create something that looks soft and lifelike not hard and dried out like a piece of jerky. That makes sense. All right, we have time maybe for um, one more question. Um, Javian and Caitlin were wondering, have you ever made a mistake when you've been working on your taxidermy and what happens if you mess up? <laughs> yes, mistakes do happen. I do make mistakes. I'm absolutely not perfect. I'm not the best taxidermist in the world, but the ability to see your mistakes and then try and correct them or make them less noticeable, or maybe the animal, because it's the salvage animal, has some serious issues that I don't want you to see. So I've got to do something to try and hide that. So um, I've never done anything that I was completely happy with. Anything I look at, I look at later and go, you know, that could be better. And if you think about it, really capturing life, capturing the illusion of life, using the real animal skin, right? So it's, you, you expect it to be look real, right? Well, that is a challenge. And I'm never quite there, but I'm going to keep trying. As long as I'm doing taxidermy, as long as I'm doing the museum, the advantage I have partly is in a diorama setting, it's the whole view collective you're not generally zeroing in on my mistakes. Now, you're not even luckily zeroing in on some of my, really the specimens, some of the specimens I have on exhibit like the cheetah downstairs, it's not really a mistake, but I had to use two skins because they were both in really bad condition. So patching that skin together so it looks to you like a live animal, oh my goodness, that was really tricky. In another way, like the polar bear, right? Trying to do something. Do I think I could do a much better polar bear? I do. But people like that polar bear. I've, I, a little hard for me to look at because I see the flaws, but I love it that people like it. 
Well, I love hearing all about your passion for this work and thank you so much for giving us a behind the scenes in the taxidermy studio at the museum and hearing all about the lions. It was fantastic being with you today, Tim. Thank you for being, for providing this opportunity and thank you all for being part of my life. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tim. I'm gonna go ahead and close us out of our program today. So I'm gonna pop up my last slide here. Um, if you enjoyed this program and want to see other things that uh, we have on our YouTube channel or on our Instagram, you can visit us at NHMLA on Instagram or at youtube.com slash NHMLA. There's a really cool time lapse of Tim um, working on the lion diorama. So you can see all the updates and see the lions getting moved around. Super awesome. There's also a brief video about some of the process if you want to dive in more um, and learn a little bit more about that diorama. So thanks again to our students. We'll be back next week with another special guest and we hope you have a, a lovely weekend. Bye everybody.